Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior at UCLA and the Resnick Neuropsychiatric Hospital Board of Advisors and WOW the Wonder of Women, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's Open Mind program on being together six feet apart with Dr. Robert Builder in conversation with Dr. Wendelin Slusser. Now I know I just mentioned the names of three organizations and while I won't give you a quiz on them, I do hope that you'll keep in mind that all of us at UCLA who are dedicated to supporting mental health care, education, research, are, have come together to bring you these open mind programs that are informative, inspiring, and engaging during the coronavirus era. For those of you who are with us for the first time, just a little bit about the open mind. It brings together thought leaders in science and culture to present programs about mental health issues as a free public service to the community. These programs were held in person at UCLA until the coronavirus era, when we quickly pivoted to this virtual platform so that we could continue to bring programs to our community and beyond. The silver lining here is that now that we have gone to this virtual platform, we are able to welcome people who live outside the Los Angeles area to our community of people who are interested in mental health, who are interested in raising awareness and erasing the stigma of mental illness that affects 46.6 million people every year in this country alone. And that statistic is from before the coronavirus era. And I would venture to say that it has now gone up. Um, we're honored to have with us today two preeminent UCLA professors, Dr. Robert Builder and Dr. Wendelin Slusser, who will speak to us about staying socially and emotionally connected during the coronavirus era. Together, they will share what they know about the impacts of the global pandemic on our emotional health and what to do to maximize well being in ourselves and others. Dr. Wendelin Slusser is the Associate Vice Provost for the Semmel Institute Healthy Campus Initiative Center and a clinical professor of pediatrics at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and at the School of Public Health. She is also the co-founder and academic director of the UCLA Fit for Healthy Weight program. Dr. Robert Builder is a distinguished professor and chief of the Division of Psychology at the Semmel Institute and the Department of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. He's also the director of the Tenenbaum Center for the Biology of Creativity and the co-director of the Mind Well Pod of the Healthy Campus Initiative. So just a few housekeeping things before I turn this over to Dr. Builder. Uh, proximate time for our program will be 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes for Q&A included in that. And if you would like to ask a question of either Dr. Slesser or Dr. Builder, you will see a Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. Um, please type in your question there. Uh, specify if it's for one uh, particular discussant or if it's a general question. And Dr. Builder and Dr. Slesser will do their very best to answer as many questions as they can in the allotted time. So thank you very much. And please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Robert Builder. Okay. Thank you so much, Vicki. I'm gonna try to share my screen and simultaneously launch a presentation. And so this will be our first opportunity to have technical problems emerge. But I hope that everyone can see the screen now. Um, and this is the title that actually was invented in part by Wendy Slusser, who you'll be hearing from soon, um, and uh, in our work together on the Healthy Campus Initiative. Um, uh, Wendy has, has really been uh, our fearless leader in thinking about how we can uh, promote our well-being 
um, and promote living well despite all the challenges of uh, the coronavirus era. Um, it's been a great honor to work together with Wendy on the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center at UCLA um, and uh, to follow on the, the work that we've been able to do with, uh, with Jane and Terry Semmel over the years and their amazing support for our entire uh, institute, the Semmel Institute, um, and their support now for the, the Semmel UCLA Healthy Campus Initiative Center. It's just, it's really uh, an inspiration to us all. And uh, never were we more needed than, um, than today. Um, I, I think we all try to keep up with the news. I have my primary source of news, uh, The Onion, a very reliable source of news. And for those who um, you know, have been working at home, um, you may recognize um, the, the dilemma we face of how we're trapped in infinite loop of telling each other, oh, sorry, no, you go ahead. And that situation, of course, is even worse when the bandwidth uh, changes. And some people really feel challenged by uh, this period where we're exposed to constant Zoom meetings. In fact, I, because I work in psychiatry research, developed what we call a diagnostic criteria for ZAD or Zoom associated delirium. This is the kind of problem that usually uh, begins to occur after someone has been exposed for more than three hours a day to these live video conversations and is associated with a lot of symptoms, disturbances of consciousness, headaches, nausea, intense cravings to visit the refrigerator or return to bed um, and to try to interact with other beings that uh, occupy less than one tenth of a degree of your visual angle. So looking at tiny people and trying to interact with them socially can, can be a big challenge. Um, uh, one of the one of the challenges that is associated with Zoom associated delirium is an obsession also with choosing virtual backgrounds. And I, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently um, standing in the uh, Murphy Sculpture Garden at UCLA, one of the most beautiful spots on campus. Um, but I'm I'm quite delighted to be there and and with you all. Um, for those of us who've been going through this, this is a, a depiction of how some of us feel. Um, you know, we were able to get through March. You know, not that bad shape. As things persisted into April, we may have started to become a little bit unraveled. Now that we're in mid-May, um, uh, I think some of us are starting to feel a little excessively challenged. And we've been hearing this about um, people's uh, struggles with, uh, with their own mental health. Um, and one of the explanations of this comes back from you know, the 1930s. This is a nice article from 1956, the American Journal of Psychiatry. Um, a scientist and physician named Hans Seeley um, described what he called the general adaptation syndrome. But basically, the idea was that many of us can handle an acute stressor, and that first stage, the alarm reaction, includes a whole bunch of physiological responses to stressors. And, uh, you know, those quick challenges we usually are able to bounce back from to show that kind of resilience uh, relatively well. Um, if the, the, um, the, the stressors continue over a somewhat longer period of time, we then develop uh, resistance to the ongoing stresses. Um, and then we may show symptoms like irritability, frustration, or concentration. But as that stress continues over a longer period of time, usually that period of time is thought to be about a month or two, um, then we go into a, a stage of exhaustion, which is characterized by fatigue, burnout, depression, anxiety, and then an, an overall decrease in our, our tolerance for stress. So I think that um, you know, this um, global pandemic is showing us the emergence of some of these features on a relatively grand scale. Uh, and we're uh, you know, now experiencing uh, you know, some of the longer term effects as the limitations and restrictions and the, the challenges of this pandemic um, uh, are, are upon us. Um, but just for inspirational purposes, um, you know, I always like to look at these inspirational messages, and this is one that really caught my eye. You know, whoever said one person can't change the world never ate an undercooked bat. Now, I want to acknowledge right away that we know that COVID-19 is not something that you can uh, contract probably from eating, although I still don't recommend eating any, any bats at all. Um, but anyhow, I, I thought this was a, a fun message. Um, <laughs> uh, meanwhile, you know, what we've been doing is monitoring how people are responding. And one nice survey um, came actually from the Chronicle of Higher Education and is a student survey. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, I think what we're seeing is a high 
degree of stress or anxiety. And 91% of students feel stress or anxiety as a result of um, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. 81% um, are showing disappointment or sadness, 80% loneliness or isolation. And then additionally, there's the financial setbacks in about half and relocation in more than half. So these are some major causes of stress um, that are occurring in our student body. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that for, for many of us, like our students, we end up uh, having the feeling that we are sort of floating in this interminable space of the COVID era. Um, and I think that what struck me in digging uh, into and, and drilling down on some of these students' responses is when we try to see exactly what kind of challenges are students facing beyond generalized stress and anxiety. 76% of students are saying that they're having trouble maintaining a routine. Um, and I've heard this from a number of our UCLA students separately from this survey, um, that students really feel disoriented. And that's in addition to having challenges getting enough physical activity um, and staying connected with others. Um, but uh, among these uh, challenges, the focusing on schoolwork despite distractions has been one of the most difficult things about the, the stay at home orders. Um, and um, uh, I do want to point out additionally that more than talking about uh, COVID-19, students say the number one way parents can support them is by spending time with them. And we're going to return to that social uh, factor. Uh, but this routine factor, I think, is something that brought to mind some other old discoveries. And that also enables me to introduce a word that you may not have heard before. And as, as Wendy knows, I love to invent words or to use words that are not in common usage so that it gives a chance to explain them. Um, and we'll come to another one later. But first is Zeitgebers, which is basically the German word for time givers or time cues. Um, that govern our biological clocks. And I think that, you know, as students were explaining to me what's going on for them, how they felt disoriented, couldn't keep track of their schedule, it occurred to me that there's this interaction, not only of the time being less structured, but of the space being less structured. In contrast to students who were in dorms, being able to walk down the hill to classes, being in a new class space, or many of the rest of us, leaving our homes, getting in the car, driving to the office, getting into the office, having all of those spatial cues together with the time of day cues and the cues that come from eating in different places, working in different places, um, working out in different places, enjoying the outdoors in different places. Um, all of those things give us cues that help to organize our brains and our bodies. And uh, we all have heard about our circadian rhythms. You know we all have biological clocks that fluctuate around 24 hours, but pretty tightly around 24 hours. So within about a plus or minus 11 minutes, most of us really do have a bio clock that, that um, uh, keeps us on track in this 24-hour schedule. And it's particularly responsive to light and dark cycles so that if we're not enjoying the sunlight the same way we usually would be, that's a problem. It's also governed by our feeding uh, cues, uh, by our sleep cues, by various exercise cues that occur um, with uh, regularity during the day, and, and by temperature cues. And all of these um, uh, inputs um, control central clock mechanisms in the brain that govern a whole bunch of internal biology, the biology of our gut, the biology of our livers, our pancreas, the immune system. And, and all the other organs in the body. So I think that one of the key things that um, we can probably focus on to enhance our well-being um, is to try to think about what are our personal zeitgeibers <laughs> um, and uh, what, what can we do to make sure we're getting zeitgeibers uh, when we need them. So among those things, sleep. Um, you know, bedtime is a good thing to have a fixed time, to not binge on Netflix interminably, um, but to actually get to bed. Another thing that many people may not think about is to have a lower temperature at night. That actually can be another uh, uh, cue for your internal biology to, to keep you on track. And then also, as annoying as it may be, having an alarm clock that gets you up at the same time every day. Having a regular and fixed rest activity cycle, including a normal sleep-wake cycle, can really be valuable. The other thing about eating, well, you know, many of us are, you know, are inclined, like I had pointed out in the Zoom-associated delirium, to be attracted to go to the refrigerator when it's right in the next room. 
Um, eating regularly, I think, is, is important as a, as a cue to all of our internal biology and our brain biology. And then if ever there was a time to you know, keep sh make sure your exercise is built in, recognize that we're not doing some of the usual walking that we would be at work, from building to building, from office to office or upstairs. Um, and so we really need to build in that kind of a habit into our daily life. And the other thing is the, the critical importance of light. You know, the, the brain responds to, and a key regulator of these internal clocks are the light dark cycles. So getting outside, letting the light shine into your face uh, in midday is a really good idea. And it's also a really good idea to limit exposure to blue green light at night. And particularly the exposure from these little devices that we carry around um, our phones and our computers. Now, about other kinds of well-being, I wanted to touch on some of these. Um, there's a really cool uh, diagram put together by Carol Riff and Burton Singer um, that describes all the different core processes that go into uh, psychological well-being. They identified six major facets of psychological well-being, which are identified in this, this diagram. And two of them are really affected by the COVID era uh, Im impediments. Um, one of those is to autonomy. So we are not actually permitted to do the things, whatever we want to do. Our personal autonomy is actually challenged by the restrictions and the greater good of trying to control our um, uh, going out and doing whatever we want to do um, and, and expressing our sense of autonomy. And the other is environmental mastery. How could we be less in control of our environments at this time when the environment is, is more or less untouchable and when we have to avoid being out in it? However, at the same time, I think we do have a number of COVID era opportunities. Um, and these are areas I think that we can focus on and double down on trying to enhance our experience within these areas. And so that includes area of positive relationships, of self-acceptance, and of finding purpose in life um, and room for personal growth. So let me just touch a little bit on some of those areas. And the first one, the social factors. And I like to highlight pictures of these um, pretty and cute little rodents. They're, they're actually called prairie voles. This is a species of vole that is well known for showing side-by-side -side behavior and a lot of good maternal behavior. And the bottom line is that there's a lot about their brain biology that leads them to behave in this way. But in this COVID era, we are being deprived of the usual side-by-side -side behavior that tends to tickle our brains, tickle certain regions in our brains, and stimulate certain um, neurotransmitters and hormones to be providing us with this sense of well-being. So the kinds of things that we can do is really double down on trying to be in touch, to express love, care, and concern, um, to express sympathy, um, and all these forms of emotional sustenance, uh, and to provide instrumental assistance and coping assistance to others. These are the kinds of things that will not only be good for the others, but also be good for us and to keep our biology in tune. Um, that includes empathic understanding, um, you know, and acceptance of ventilation if somebody else needs to express stronger feelings and, and uh, unhappy feelings to be able to, to handle that. Um, and then to um, uh, consider the threats and reappraise them uh, for what they are. Uh, many of us um, have had life-threatening circumstances that we face due to the COVID uh, pandemic, but many others have not. And so I think we need to try to do our best to reframe things when all seems very bleak um, and to focus on the silver, silver linings when we can um, and to promote um, companionship when we can. Now you may wonder, well, that's hard to do in the COVID era, but there's many things we can do. So um, I found that masking can be a good thing. It, it let me bond more with my German Shepherd, Maverick. And at the same time, I was able to bond more with Maverick and, and get closer to him. I shared this image with other people online. And this kind of personal sharing online has led to lots of unexpected circumstances. So I now know that three other colleagues of mine all have German Shepherds, including one that is quite expert at billiards. So um, I think you never know um, what's going to happen until you try. And I think that sharing more of ourselves, um, even if it's in this online experience, can lead to the kinds of connections that will help to promote well-being. And certainly these, uh, these images uh, help, uh, help me feel better. Now, at the same time, we're uh, confronting some other big changes in this country. Um, it was actually Wendy that, that pointed out to me something that David Brooks has been doing, which is the, the WEAVE project that fo focuses on community engagement. 
And what, what David has noticed is that over time, the amount of trust that we're experiencing throughout our country has been decreasing. So you can see we started in 1972 with a relatively green map where people showed that they were trusting each other. But as we progressed into the 90s here and into the uh, 2000s, we're seeing the reddish is fewer and fewer people are trusting um, their, uh, their uh, comrades within our own country. Um, and this spirit of distrust is something that you know, really seems to have been maximized over the last, you know, four years or so. And um, so that's something that is is quite troubling, this trust ratio, you know, the feeling that you can generally trust people or that you can't be too careful in dealing with people. I think that's something that David Brooks and his uh, new effort are trying to overcome um, and, and, and bring us to um, uh, a relationalist period. Um, and uh, I think that you can um, uh, look up, weave, and download their entire publication if you're interested in this. It's a social fabric project that really tries to um, uh, begin with the idea that our social fabric is in, in being challenged, but that now is a time when we can double down and focus on what we can do to promote a better in interweaving of our lives, to recognize our value as individuals, but also to be connected to and reach out to others. I think that is the kind of thing that will provide meaning and purpose in our lives. And that brings me to my um, final point beyond relationalism is eudaimonia, another word that not many people understand, but which we focused on in the Healthy Campus Initiative. Eudaimonia in brief means living life with purpose and meaning. And it goes back to the time of Plato and Aristotle. Here you can see on the left of your screen, Plato saying, no, there's only one kind of happiness. Aristotle's going, no, no, there's actually more than one kind of happiness. There's the brief and fleeting happiness we call hedonia, but then there's the long lasting and sustained happiness that comes from living life with meaning and purpose. We call that eudaimonia or the true spirit. And um, just to give you a flavor for um, what you you know, in psychology, if you can't measure something, um, it doesn't exist. So we have to have a questionnaire for everything. So if you can answer these three questions with agree or strongly agree, like my life is centered around a set of core beliefs that give meaning to my life, or I feel best when I'm doing something worth investing a great deal of effort in, or I can say I have found my purpose in life. These are the core elements of eudaimonia. And I think that's one thing that we've been finding is during this coronavirus pandemic, many people for whatever reason, whether it's being disconnected from their usual work and occupations um, or, or other reasons, have really had an opportunity to focus on what is truly important. What are the things that make a difference? And I think that is the kind of um, process and work that enables us to look towards a brighter future as we come out of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. I know um, uh, Vicky in the beginning of our session was talking about finding silver linings. And I think if we do find a silver lining, this may well be it. Um, and um, a nice recent um, uh, article in the Yale environment wondered when social distancing ends, will we rethink the world we want and begin um, through um, ending this strange experience, focus on how we can move forward in a more positive and productive way into a new world that, uh, that I hope will be enhanced um, uh, for what we've all gone through together. So with that, let me thank you all. Um, and uh, let me see if I can uh, bring on uh, Wendy's slides. Just give me a moment. Here we go. And please do um, enter things into the Q&A um, if you can. And uh, as soon as- uh, I think that's the Wendy's last slide, Bob. Whoops, uh-oh. <laughs> right, so Thank you. Don't, hopefully nobody has a good working memory. They won't <laughs> forget all that that you said. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Bob, and um, also Vicki and Wendy, and um, the other Wendy, and Jason for the support for this um, presentation. It's always hard to follow Bob, but I wanted to, him to warm up the crowd, so uh, hopefully you're all warmed up, and now you can have a little bit of a, a less, less a sort of comedic uh, slides to look at for, for moving forward here. Um, so I'm going to talk about building a culture of health and equity one campus at a time. Next slide, please. Oh, 
Bob's moving my slide, thanks. And a culture of health is the fifth wave in public health. And as all of you know, in the late 1900s, clean water, sewers and drainage was the first wave of public health to prevent disease such as cholera. In the 20th century, the second wave was the discovery of antibiotics and vaccines. And the third wave was the life that we recognized that lifestyle was impacting health. The fourth wave was the social determinants of health that were identified as a driver for well being and longevity. And now the fifth wave of public health is building a culture of health movement, which is really making the healthy choice the easy choice. Next slide, please. So how do we inspire a culture for health and movement for individuals, communities, and the planet? Well, many of us have been on this couch and others have been off the couch, nudging people off the couch. Uh, I want a fitness video, do you deliver? That's my only funny slide. Okay, next slide, please. Well, the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative has been building a culture of health for over eight years. Now, Jane and Terry Semmel's idea was very simple. It was, we were doing a really good job treating disease at UCLA, but not such a good job preventing disease. The goal was to make UCLA the healthiest campus to learn, live, play, and work for the over 85,000 students, staff, and faculty and inspire others. Next slide, please. The facts are, in just two years after HCI's inception, we inspired President Napolitano to launch the Global Food Initiative, followed by the Healthy Campus Network, with great success on all 10 campuses. To our great delight, Michelle Obama launched the Healthier Campus Initiative across the U.S. in Partnership for Healthy America in 2014, based on our proven UCLA model. And since then, UC Health, Health and System-Wide HR has supported the Healthy Beverage Initiative, the Diabetes Prevention Program, and the Stress-Free and Nutrition Research, UCY. Next slide, please. The strategy is to build on the strengths of anchor institutions, in other words, asset mapping and mobilization. And we are proving to be an unstoppable movement where people at UCLA are thinking outside of the box, relying on science as our ally to support our social, emotional, and physical health. Next slide, please. So how does Semmel HCI impact disaster management phases during the COVID-19 pandemic? Well, if you look at the four different phases of disaster management, their preparedness, response, recovery, and resurgence. Next slide, please. Frieden's Health Impact Pyramid has helped HCI identify work that can be high impact at every level to build a culture of health that has prepared UCLA and UC wide for the COVID-19 pandemic, unbeknownst to any of us. Starting with the base universities, you can click, can directly impact the socioeconomic factors, not only through graduating students, but also as a large employer, we can impact economic well being of staff and faculty. In fact, UC is the number one employer outside of the federal and state government in California. Moving up the pyramid, clicking up the pyramid, we work on making the healthy choice the easy choice all the way up to counseling and education, all the way up there, to <laughs> counseling and education like the CDC Diabetes Prevention Program. Next slide, please. The CDC DPP program launched by Semmel HCI in 2016, led by Dr. Tanaz Moyne of Medicine and Kelly Shedd and Samantha Soatanga in Recreation. There is now over 80, over 800 people who've attended the Diabetes Prevention Program UC-wide and we're now offering it virtually during the pandemic. As we all know, the Diabetes Prevention Program reduces the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by 58% if you're pre-diabetic. This program has therefore prepared a large group of students, staff, and faculty to be better prepared for COVID-19 since we know that diabetes is one of the biggest risk factors for morbidity and mortality for, uh, if you are suffering from COVID-19. One participant from our diabetes prevention program said the following, right now the information given to us is perfect as I'm overloaded with too much input during COVID. Knowing that support is available via quick email to our, our leader, our diabetes prevention leader is critical and she's great. Right now my only focus is to stay healthy, safe and sane, sane written in four capital letters. 
This course is a pillar right now. On the right, you'll see some grad students in a teaching kitchen experience that's now gone virtual. UCLA research by grad students Tyler Watson and Hannah Milan allowed us to respond in a timely manner to precipitous rise in student food insecurity during COVID-19 pandemic because we have this teaching kitchen that they um, really pretty much supported through their research as a method to help people with food insecurity is giving students who are food insecure lessons on how to make healthful uh, food on a budget. We're offering support now to Tony Sandeville and his talented team at the UCLA Community Program Office for the virtual food closet and virtual teaching kitchen classes for food insecure students. And we have over 300 students, graduate students participating currently with some famous chefs teaching the classes such as Bill Yosis, former White House pastry chef uh, for Obama and Bush. Next slide, please. Importantly, hot off the press, we focused on COVID-19 scientific articles, just like Bob was referring to his data. One study reported how people who have been quarantined suffer from short and long-term negative psychological effects like PTSD and anger. A proven strategy to prevent this is to appeal to humans' innate altruism. In other words, reminding them about the benefits of quarantining to others. An age-old storytelling and giving to others are also ways to promote altruism. Now, I'd like to share a story uh, that happened to me early on in Shelter in Place. I texted Staff Assembly President Lucy Tang on a Saturday about what are we doing about the first-line workers and how are they managing their own food needs. She immediately responded and connected me to the awesome health system development team, Jordan Catron, Ellen Hadigan, Laura Moss, and Lindsay Williams, who had been given so many roles like feeding the thousands of frontline health workers. I then introduced them to a group of enterprising moms in LA community that were organizing food deliveries to LA hospitals. And in record time, our health system development team worked out the logistics, including food safety and led the Jose Andres World Central Kitchen to deliver 800 meals and snacks three times a week to our heroic frontline health workers, and that's still ongoing. Next slide, please. Now, Six Feet Apart uh, also was a way to tell stories via a podcast, and this was launched by Semele CI. In a viewer-grabbing twist, we feature thought leaders from UCLA and others across the globe to address pressing issues. And the Managing Stress and Anxiety podcast is one that our wonderful Dr. Bob Builder uh, is interviewed along with Dr. Nicole Green, who both lead the MindWell pod. We also have social engagement pod, uh, I mean, a social engagement pod, and Ted Robles is one of the leaders of that, and he's uh, interviewed for the social engagement resilience is Dr. Chris Dunkelshedder. Mind Gut Connection is Emmer and Mayer, and that he is part of our Semmel Institute, of course. And then we also have The New Normal, which is a podcast interview with uh, Dr. Chai, who's as in, from Singapore. We're about to launch the retiree uh, interview as well. Next slide, please. Now, long-term preparation work through Semmel HCI in collaboration with Renee Fortier, Director of Transportation, and Fielding School of Public Health, Dr. Dick Jackson, has set the stage to fast track the bike lane from Santa Monica Hospital to Ronald Reagan Hospital during the COVID-19 recovery period. And during the response to COVID-19, the Jane B. Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Community Garden is not only providing weekly harvests to our community, we're also supporting our students, staff, and faculty's efforts in technical assistance uh, virtually to start their own victory gardens. Next slide, please. And this pandemic offers an opportunity for even more action by UCLA leaders and our community. As David Brooks says, we're standing at a portal to the future. How about if we reimagined this street that was emptied by COVID and imagine bike lanes or imagine parklets or imagine larger sidewalks to walk on? Next slide, please. Now that the curves are flattening across the US, what does this mean? Uh, click down one, please. Thanks. We need to identify unifying themes for the recovery and resurgence. And one way is to think about, one way is to think about how do we answer this question? What good thing do you think will come out of this pandemic? 
In other words, what do you see that has been good for you or your work? I asked this question at our Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Steering Committee, which is made up of deans, vice chancellors, faculty, student leaders, and others. And here are some of their responses, which many of you might relate to. Our behavior not only affects our health, but others. Virtual work is possible, but perhaps not 100%. Extreme societal inequities have been exposed and need to be addressed. Appreciating cleaner air and seeing the stars. Getting more sleep and being less frantic. More connected and present. Walking in neighborhood and talking to neighbors. These are normal. Cooking from scratch more and grateful for the little things. I think someone's not muted. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, I mean, not next slide, next thing. So other other uh, unifying themes that we can have, which I feel we can work towards, are keeping the momentum and strive for health equity. Next. Prioritize health as much as wealth. Forge strategies for integrative health, social, physical, emotional, planetary, spiritual, and financial. And implement national service for all. And the first bullet uh, I didn't really expand on, but to say that when we answer that question of what we find positive during this time, whether it's personal or at work, let's hold on to those good things we've learned during this pandemic and carry them forward. Okay, next slide, please. So you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. And we have such a wealth of talent and uh, the ability to move things forward on a university campus. So let's lead in a collective impact format and blend a narrative for a culture of health with our transdisciplinary teams at Semmel Institute, at Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative, on the UCLA campuses UC wide. And let's asset map and mobilize our policies, our research, our academic service and operations so that we can, we can respond, we can recover, and we can resurge with a better world. Next. So I'll end with the little prince quote, what makes the desert beautiful, said the little prince, is that somewhere it hides a well. I'd like to thank, next slide, please. I'd like to make, give a special thanks to Jane and Terry Semmel for envisioning and supporting the Semmel Healthy Campus Initiative Center at UCLA. And the next slide has a variety of uh, links and um, logos for our, our pods. Thank you so much. So great. Thank you so much, Wendy. I had to figure out how to both stop the slides and uh, You did a good, thank you so much. You did a great job. It's <laughs> always a little bit of a technical challenge there. Um, yeah. And so we, we do have some questions that uh, have been coming in. Um, and uh, one of which is, uh, can slides be made available? And I think that we'll be able to, to do that. Um, we'll talk with them. Um, um, the, the friends about what's the easiest way to do that. Um, if not, um, if there's not an easy way to do it via their, uh, one of their sites, um, then you're feel free to um, send me an email. I'm easy to find at UCLA, uh, just Robert Builder, B-I-L-D-E-R, R Builder at MedNet. Um, but if you just Google it, it'll, it'll come up. Um, and I'm happy to send the slides out. Um, and then, um, Oh, one other uh, question that had, had come up is, um, you know, what are the kinds of things that, um, you know, that, that we have learned um, in this time? And I, I noted both a personal and a professional um, uh, take, take home from the pandemic. Um, the personal one is how, um, while I'm so disappointed for my kids, I have twins who are high school seniors graduating and they're losing their graduation and it's you know very sad. At the same time, the silver lining of that is that I'm getting to be with them at a time that I usually wouldn't. And so I think the kind of connection that I've been able to have with the kids has been unique and special and is something I'll never forget and I'm very grateful for. On the professional side, um, in neuro I'm a neuropsychologist and uh, that involves a lot of person-to-person -person interaction. And of course, during the pandemic, it's all 
put on hold. But what we were able to do is within one week, a move to a new tele neuropsychology platform, um, doing neuropsychological exams over Zoom and other related resources and coordinate a national effort um, to make that happen. And I think that's something I never would have thought of doing before, um, but I'm so uh, proud to have been a part of the effort to do that. How about you, Wendy? Yeah, I was just uh, cruising <laughs> through them, trying to listen to your answers at the same time. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, uh, well, I just answered one. Someone wanted to know how to get our podcasts. Um, it's on our it's on our website, and I just uh, typed in the um, link for our website, which is at the direct link, but it's healthy.ucla.edu. Also, you can look up on your um, iPhone. You can just look up Live Well podcasts. There are a couple of them, but if you see our logo, the UCLA Seminole Healthy Chemist logo, that's the one that you can subscribe to. Um, I really rec recommend them. I mean, you know, Bob is just an incredible wealth of knowledge and has a lot to say and uh, in a good way. <laughs> uh, and I love interviewing him in so many different capacities. Uh, we also have his first podcast that he did way back a year ago about music and the brain. And it's just really rich with uh, information about all the limbic system and how you can get rewarded by music as much as food almost in, in a lot of ways. So. Uh, I also um, had another question there was related to two questions. One was about food insecurity. There's a, a USDA um, standardized tool that you can use to measure food insecurity that's reliable for adults. And we've been doing it uh, now at UCLA for about six years. And now it's about four years ago, UCY did it, a series of those um, questionnaires across the campuses and we found in our campus that we have over 30 percent before pre-COVID of students that are food insecure either extremely or moderately food insecure so we've um, had a effort over the last 10 years um, and that's been led by Tony Sandoval and the community program office to support students to help them Improve their security through food closet, but also through um, access of for what's called um, SNAP nationally, but um, CalFresh, which is the old fashioned, the old, uh, it's the newer way of saying what used to be called food stamps. And students are eligible for it. Uh, and so we've been able to really help support students to um, apply for that. Uh, and they can get up to $190 a month uh, for food assistance under that particular um, F, uh, that program. The um, food insecurity has dramatically increased since COVID-19, and that's where we've been really responding, um, not just with this virtual food closet, which is a, a card, uh, a, a, a card to Ralph's, but it's also um, the food, the, the, the kitchen, because we really do, um, throughout, based on that research, we found that students uh, can really make, you know, stretch their dollars if they know what to do with the food that they um, purchase. Uh, and it, it, see, it can be seasonal and larger amounts and things like that. So that's the question about the food security. The other question was about, um, which is sort of goes hand in hand in terms of who's most affected by this COVID-19 or the most vulnerable populations in our society. And that includes um, people, uh, lower socioeconomic and people of color and other um, people in um, who have generally um, maybe not there's a higher incidence not only of people with diabetes that are getting the high mortality and morbidity but people with BMIs over 30 which means they um, are in the category of of being called having obesity and also a hypertension so these are people that um, are not in in great health and those are usually often people that have less access to high quality medical care, but also live in, in communities where they might have food deserts or they might be living um, in places where they can't uh, go outside. Uh, what do you do about that? Well, I think that there's a lot of research and a lot of people on our campus and UCY that have been working hard towards even raising the awareness around this. And I think that because we have this window, just like the portal, like, like David Brooks is saying, I think that we have the opportunity right now in David Brooks's op-ed at the end of April, he said, most of us right now, actually, we're more unified now than we have ever been. Majority of people agree we should be sheltering at home to, to help the better good. The majority of people think that we should be getting assistance from the government to help the community, whether it's the small businesses or, you know, people who have lost their jobs. So um, 
I think this is an opportunity because people realize that there is this disparity and we need to we need to grab it and take make it make a difference about it. And that one of them will one of the ideas he had was was a national service, which I could see. Like imagine everyone, how unifying is that if everyone was required to do a national service? And for every year you gave a national service, maybe you get a free year of public university education, like a one-to-one, -one, like a GI bill, but it would be like an S N S bill. So that's, I'll that's, get off my soapbox. <laughs> no, I think that's a great soapbox that we should all be on. Yeah. I think that that's, you know, the, um, the um, discovery of the really unfortunate inequities in healthcare that have been revealed by the pandemic is one of the, one of the points that we must hope will be a lasting silver lining that comes out of this is that by revealing the inequities that we'll actually work together to do something about it. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, one of our questioners was asking, what can we do to assist? I think there's a lot that, that can be done. I know um, in the Division of Psychology down at the Semmel Institute in the Department of Psychiatry, we've been um, pulling together opportunities for volunteerism that um, you know, can be contributed to. And one of the ones that I think is really a great one, and please feel free to send me an email about that, and we can, we can help, is at Charles Drew University. They've been coordinating people to, to help with um, uh, testing um, especially in areas of Los Angeles where there's the greatest need. And I think that there's, there's even more that can be done in terms of overcoming some of the, the information divide because the way information is getting out to uh, communities of color and people who are um, less privileged and as Wendy was saying, have less access to the high quality healthcare. Um, many people don't know exactly what are the, um, uh, the opportunity to protect one's health. Um, in, in the same way that those who have other information rich channels and more access to technology do. So I think um, there, are, there are a number of things that, that we can do in that respect. There was one other uh, question that, that came up that I wanted to just touch on and maybe Wendy would add to that as well. And it, 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 it's about how, to, how do we respond to those uh, with whom we may vehemently disagree um, or where we feel that people are spreading information um, so that we don't um, uh, escalate the anger. And I think that's it's one of the, the big risks of the pandemic um, and that we see being enacted um, uh, in our news channels and politically every day. And I think we all really need to work hard to, to overcome the divisiveness that has been occurring um, uh, nationally and, and instead find the areas of commonality. Um, there are a lot of practices um, of acceptance that start with acceptance of the self. Many of them come from um, the contemplative practices and meditation practices. Um, and um, I think that that kind of acceptance of ourselves that can then extend acceptance to others is a key uh, takeaway and something that we can focus on during the pandemic that will actually end up putting us in a place that's more connected following the David Brooks model, more weaved together than we were before. I'd like I see we have our fearless leader, Vicki, is back. <laughs> <laughs> I know we could go on, but our time, unfortunately, has come to a close. And I would like to give a huge thank you to Dr. Slusser and Dr. Builder for taking the time from your very busy schedules to share your knowledge and expertise with all of us. And thank you for the tips on how we can be more socially and emotionally connected during this very challenging time. And I think being on this Zoom platform with, with all of you is one of those ways. And I'm very happy that we can offer that to the community. Um, please join us on June 4th when we will welcome author Robert Kolker, who wrote the best-selling New York Times and Oprah endorsed book, Hidden Valley Road. He will be joined in discussion by Dr. Stephen Martyr, our uh, world-renowned expert on schizophrenia and one of the siblings from the family that is written about in the book. So please join us. Uh, all the links are on our website, friendsofthesemilinstitute.org. It's free, four o'clock, June 4th. Stay well. Stay healthy, and we'll see you then. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. So much. Thanks so much. Thanks for including us. Thank yeah. you.